YouTube page. Welcome to the first week of our speaker series forum for the League of Women Voters of Moscow. We'll announce our next speaker at the end of today, but first I want to introduce today's speaker and the event. So today we're very pleased to welcome Deanna Burrell. Deanna is the Development and Marketing Administrator for the Idaho State Historical Society and Foundation for Idaho History. After spending 19 years in the financial services sector, Deanna followed her passions to the nonprofit sector where she has served in program development, fundraising and leadership roles in organizational management, STEM, human services, humanities and conservation nonprofits. Outside of her professional life, Deanna, her husband and their two rescue black labs spend as much time as possible in nature. She is also starting a new position with the Idaho Conservation League. So she's actually occupying both roles currently. <laughs> Deanna, I'll turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today. I know everybody has busy schedules and Kylie, I appreciate the warm welcome and Lauren, you too, thank you. I'm going to share my screen, which, you know, after two plus years of Zoom, you'd think wouldn't be as nerve wracking as it is, but there we have it. Uh, that comes through okay. Kylie, can you see that? Okay, great. Well, again, thank you. Um, I really appreciate being on this, this series, it's really quite an honor. And I wanna also give a nice um, thank you to Earl Bennett who made these connections so we could all talk about this. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our Idaho Women's Suffrage Commemorative Sculpture, which is uh, symbolizing all Idaho women and what that means. Um, but we're gonna kind of jump back and forth through history a little bit as we talk about it. Now this piece is a legacy of the 2020 commemoration of the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which you all, I'm sure, are aware, um, granted voting rights to most American women. Um, the Idaho State Historical Society is championing this project in partnership with the Idaho Commission on the Arts and the Foundation for Idaho History, which is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit that helps the historical society raise funds for projects such as this. And if you're not familiar with the Idaho State Historical Society, our mission is to preserve and promote Idaho history. And we're comprised of the Idaho State Museum, the Idaho State Archives, and the Old Penitentiary, all located in Boise. The State Historic Preservation Office, which is headquartered in Boise, but has a statewide mission and gives a statewide voice to national issues around preservation. And we also have some really beautiful and amazing historic sites in Hanson, which is the Stricker, um, Stricker Ranch and Rock Creek Station, which is one of the premier sites preserved on the Oregon Trail in the country. So if you're ever in that part of the state, please go visit that site. Um, also Franklin, and then we have a historic site in Pierce in North Idaho as well. So the Historical Society um, was actually established by the Territorial Legislature in 1881, which is pretty insightful. Um, so we have amazing records going back through time and we became a state agency in 1907. In addition to um, the different areas that I mentioned, part of our museum program is the capital curation program, which a lot of people don't realize. So we steward over 1,200 artifacts that are part of the capital program, including the art and the memorials and on the state house grounds there. This is a book that we have a few copies of left that we put out last year that really explores all the artifacts in the capital. And I'd like to point out a fun fact for those of you, hopefully all of you have seen our beautiful state capital the eagle that is on top of the Capitol and the beautiful gold eagle is actually from the original USS Idaho battleship. Um, they melted down the metals from that and created that eagle to sit on top of our Capitol. So one of these fun facts you discover when you're going through all this wonderful history that we have in place. So I hope you all know that Idaho has been a long tenured leader in women's suffrage. And on November 3rd, 1896, Idaho was the fourth state, the fourth state to grant women suffrage through Idaho Senate Resolution 2. And then in 1920, took all those years later, 1920, Idaho was the 30th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, 
Interesting fact I pulled out too is the, the amendment was passed, or excuse me, the ratification was passed quite swimmingly um, with the exception of Custer County. Custer County is the only county in Idaho that did not vote for women's suffrage by the majority. Don't know why that is, but I just thought that was an interesting fact to share. Um, and I have some handouts I can share later that really go, they're more um, academic papers, but they really go in, in depth into women's suffrage. Again, I don't wanna to preach to the choir here given um, who I'm speaking to, but I, if you want that information, I'm so happy to share. So in 2020, Idaho state agencies, several nonprofits, including the Historical Society, gathered together to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment through a project called Idaho Women 100, Courageous Past, Unlimited Future. There were many activities held across the state. It was a, Iowa was very involved. A lot of um, women's groups across the state were incredibly involved in this. And the project came together and was launched on, as it would happen, Friday, March 13th, 2020. Now y'all may recall what later happened that weekend is the pandemic um, became rather pervasive and everything was shut down. So this is the last photo. These, this is a photo of almost all of the women legislators and congressional officers in the state that came together on this day. There was a statewide ceremony commemorating Idaho Women's Day, which was legislation that ISHS, the Historical Society, lobbied to have passed that year to, again, every year honor women in Idaho and all their accomplishments on March 14th. Um, we almost hesitate to show this photo because it was so close to when the pandemic started. Um, but wonderful things came of that. We were working on several legacy projects that I'll talk about a little bit more um, out of that program. But I wanna pause in 2020 and then go back in time a little bit to provide a little bit more context to some of these legacy projects that I'm gonna talk about. So the reason we chose March 14th as Women's Day is because on March 14th, 1891, is when the Idaho legislator, legislature excuse me, approved Senate Bill 103, officially enacting Emma Edwards Green's design and our motto, Esto Perpetua, to be the great seal of the state of Idaho. We believe, um, we've not seen anything to the contrary, that this is the only state seal designed by a woman in this country. And Edwards, Emma Edwards Green placed a lot of symbolic meaning within the seal itself. So I don't know how many of you have spent time really observing this seal. And this, this particular painting is an original of hers before it was made into the, the seal that is on our flag. And it's really a lovely piece that you can see in the Idaho State Museum when you're in the Boise area. So this was created during the suffrage movement. And on the seal, you can see the symbol of the woman and the man standing of equal height. And that was very important to Anna Edwards Green to show that they were of equal stature and really promote that. Um, she felt that it wouldn't be much longer until suffrage was granted and this was aspirational for her. Um, the shield has obviously a lot of beautiful symbology and at the mountains, the river is meant to represent the Snake River. The tree represents our abundant trees in the timber industry. The male, as you can see, is garbed as a miner, which was the leading industry in the state at that time. The woman is dressed really as Lady Justice, um, holding the scales of justice in her hands. And there's a sheaf of grain and the cornucopias represent abundance in the state and our great agriculture. And at the very bottom, you see that star, that represents, um, as she put it, the new light in the galaxy of states. So Idaho was a new frontier at that time and about to enter the Industrial Revolution. And she really um, thought this was a pivotal moment for Idaho to come into, into statehood at this time. Um, now, this utopian view of entirely equal rights between male and, and female has not been realized, but there's obviously been a, a great deal of progress. And, and she was very aspirational. And I think this speaks to 
the aspirations of, at that point, almost an entirely male legislature at the time, approving such a design as this. And it's, it's very inspiring. So as we look at some of the um, slides to come, please keep in mind um, what the woman on the state seal looks like. So this is the artist drawing of what the women's um, suffrage commemorative sculpture will be. Now, as I mentioned before, this started in 2020 and was really intended to be more of a commemoration of the suffrage movement. But since the pandemic put a pause on everything um, for such a long time, we took that time to really think about how could this be more inspirational and aspirational and highlight all women throughout Idaho's history, beginning with indigenous people, and also inspire the future. So in addition to this, one of the other legacy pieces that has not yet come to fruition is the, the Idaho Women 100 book, which is a, it's more of an academic textbook, but it's highlighting really the amazing women who forged Idaho and several academics are working on that. That has been put on pause because the National Archives have been closed for so long now. And uh, they're just beginning to be able to do that in-depth research to make this book really, really um, worthy of the women they're describing in the book. So we're looking to publish that in early 2023. So um, I know the Idaho State Historical Society will have a lot of publicity around when that book is available to the public. So as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the woman on the state seal that Emma Edwards Green so beautifully designed is the inspiration for this. So if you notice, the dress is very similar to that, that classic sort of Grecian draping. Um, the hair is in the bun with the waves and the um, you'll see in some other photos, there's a ribbon woven through it. And again, we're trying to tie her work in that early recognition of the importance of women to Idaho into what we're doing now with this particular piece. Um, the sculpture is another drawing of um, the sculpture. And you'll see again in the photos, it's, she's, she's changed a little bit, but the, the sentiment is the same. So she's to remind all Idahoans of the historic leadership as the fourth state, which is really impressive to grant women suffrage and then to ratify the Constitution, and to ratify the 19th Amendment of the Constitution, excuse me. So as I mentioned, the Idaho Commission on the Arts, the Historical Society, and several community partners, along with the Foundation for Idaho History, interviewed several artists and selected Irene Dealey of Boise to be the artist to create this. Um, there were many qualified people for this, but the community partners in the Foundation for Idaho History felt it was really important to have a woman sculpture create this. And Irene, you've probably seen her work. She um, most recently created the Polly Bemis sculpture that is now actually at Polly Bemis's um, site along the salmon. Um, also several, several sculptures within the city of Boise for public art installations. So Irene um, worked through several concepts over this. And then rather, as I said before, rather than looking to the past, um, as many suffrage, suffragist um, sculptures and statues are, um, she really wanted to inspire the future with that. So we hope you see the future in this. Here's, um, here are some photos of the sculpture just before she was um, sent to the foundry and enterprise. So again, similar to Emma Edwards Green, um, Irene has embedded several symbols within this sculpture. So if you look at this um, photo on the left with her back, you'll see that she has the, the dress forms into peace lilies as it drapes down her back. Um, one is to symbolize um, peace in general, but also she will be, this sculpture will be installed on the Capitol lawn in the quadrant that is opposite of the cannon. So Irene and the community members who partnered in this thought it was important to have that counterbalance, almost literally, to the canon to have this piece um, assigned draping down her back. Um, on this center picture, you can see the front 
of the sculpture. And I'll explain the shoes a little bit more in a moment. But um, if you see around her waist, that belt is looks like rebar. It's actually designed that way to formulate or to really symbolize the strength of women um, to iron and girded loins and, and really their power and strength of their internal fortitude for women. And then this photo on the far right, um, you get really a better view of, of her hair for one thing um, with the bun and that the ribbons that are woven through as are woven through on the woman on our state seal. So those are all tied together. Um, and I also want to mention this hand in this center, center photo. You see how the, the sculpture's hand is going backwards. And in the previous photos, and you'll see again in a little bit here, that hand is really offering a blessing to the past. It's blessing the shoes that came before. And those shoes really represent the footsteps of women who have come before and inspired all the great things that women across Idaho have done over the years. And so when we say that she's walking in the footsteps, um, we literally use shoes to represent that from, from decades. There are 14 sets of shoes that will be represented here, all from the collection of the Idaho State Historical Society. And while certainly not tied to suffrage, we did want to honor the Native women who came before. So we have moccasins here uh, that we, we talk to all the tribes to have a representation that would represent all of them instead of just one tribe. Um, some other shoes I really want to point out here. These are obviously not all 14, but we do have shoes from the 20s that the suffragists wore as they were marching in the streets of Baltimore and Philadelphia and Idaho to, to really garner that ability to vote. Um, we have more of the fashion shoes, like from the 50s, uh, work boots from the 60s. We do have combat boots um, from the 80s, cowboy boots as well. Um, these sandals in the center are from the 1940s, and they were donated to the Historical Society's collection by a family who had been interned at Minidoka um, during World War II, Japanese-American citizens, citizens of America um, of Japanese descent who had been incarcerated at that point. And they have, um, it's hard to see in this photo, but there are butterflies on the bottom that was very important to that culture. We also do have um, Polly Bemis's shoes represented as well in that because the Chinese immigrants were so vital to the mining industry uh, in the state at the time and were such an important port, are still such an important port, part of Idaho's history. Now, other than Polly Bemis's shoes, these shoes really aren't attributed to any one individual because we wanted them to represent all women of that era, of that time in our culture and those causes that they were working towards. Much like the sculpture herself is supposed to be representative of all women, uh, there were some suggestions early on that we would actually name her and we decided not to, because as soon as you name her, she becomes identifiable as that name and, you know, perhaps certain connotations to the history of that name and what that means. And, and we don't want that. This is representative of, of everyone. And I've had this question before, so I'm going to preempt it. We did not actually cast these shoes in bronze. Um, they were 3D printed and then casts were made of those shoes uh, to add on to this, which I am not the qualified person to talk about the STEM aspects of the process of creating the sculpture, but it really is quite fascinating. Um, I wanted to show a close up again of um, the face and the hair and this, this shoe in her hand. So again, the sculpture is walking through the footsteps of all the amazing women who've come before, and she is as you recall from the other photos, she's stepping out of her shoes and she's passing this current shoe off to future generations. Um, and this shoe in particular is a Rothy. And if you're not familiar, these are eco-friendly shoes, which is very important um, to the current 
generation of students coming up through high school and college right now, that eco-friendly aspect. So Irene put, again, a lot of thought into how we tie the generations together over the last 100 plus years. Um, this is a quick rendering of what, uh, what the sculpture is going to be on. As you'll see, there's a cascading step of stones. So the furthest, the distance uh, and time away. So the moccasins will be on this smaller step and then step up. This stone itself is about, the largest stone is about 18 inches high. And the sculpture alone is seven feet tall. So this is a formidable sculpture. And this is the only memorial to women on the Capitol grounds and in the Capitol building itself. So the sculpture and the committee the, the, of private citizens who were working towards this really felt she should be heroic size is what it's called. So um, this installation will be, the base will be installed in the Capitol grounds within the next um, several weeks. We expect that in fairly soon. And this particular photo um, or rendering is of the Capitol grounds and that X over on the right-hand side represents where she is going to be. So the Idaho Capital Commission approved the sculpture for placement in 2019. Um, so they've been looking forward to and expecting the sculpture for quite some time and are quite excited about the inspirational aspect of this. Um, as I mentioned before, the Foundation for Idaho History is very involved in this. All the funds raised to make the sculpture possible are raised from private funds. There's no taxpayer money or any state funds at all going towards this. Um, we're hoping that uh, the installation will occur before the holidays happen in December. Um, the ground placement is that the stones will be in place before, but we've run into some, uh, as a lot of people, if you've done any remodeling or working construction at all, there's been a lot of delays in um, getting those items taken care of for us. So we're delayed a little bit behind our schedule, uh, but honestly, after COVID and we were delayed for two years, another month doesn't seem that awful at this point. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, we've had a lot of statewide interest in this and a lot of statewide support for this and enthusiasm for both the look back and honoring those women who have come before and We've had several Idahoans who are seventh generation Idahoans whose ancestors uh, really helped forge the state and forge agriculture and mining and the politics of the state. And so much of this become really involved and actually quite emotional about um, what this symbolizes. And we're seeing uh, the younger generation, our up and coming leaders, female leaders, really excited about the inspirational aspect of this as well. So our hope um, from this is that you learned a little bit more about uh, Emma Edwards Green's design and why that is so symbolic and in so many ways timeless, if you think about it. I mean, what she did in that, that drawing, that painting that became our state seal over hundred years ago is still really important today uh, as, we, as we go through um, our, current, our current situation in, in our state, in our country, and is still very inspirational. So this is hoping to mimic that and carry that forward in a very bold statement. Um, so a few things if you wanted to get involved is follow the State Historical Society on social media. We'll have updates about this and other programs that tie to uh, Idaho Women's Day every March. And of course, we do um, programming around Idaho Day itself and a lot of other important state landmarks or milestones. Um, please share with your networks. Uh, there is a fundraiser coming up. I don't wanna spend time really talking about that fundraiser. But the website for that is here because that's where we have um, updates about the sculpture status, uh, the artist statement about that, all of that is gonna be on that website. And then of course, if you were inclined to make a donation, we do have that available as well. 
Um, and that QR code will take you directly to that site if you're a QR code user. So this has been actually a little bit quicker than I think I anticipated. I'm used to getting um, questions as we go <laughs> instead of at the end. Uh, but there's my email address where you can reach me uh, and our main phone number as well as the website. And Kylie and Lauren, I can't see you right now, but I do want to share one other thing um, that was part of the Idaho Women 100 and Legacy is at the Idaho State Museum. And I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to see it. We had this absolutely beautiful exhibition up about trailblazing women of Idaho. And it was on display for a year during the pandemic. So not many people got to see it. But if I can um, have a moment to share that, we did do a 360 virtual tour of it. And I just want to show you a really brief um, highlight of, of that and um, where you can go find that because it's it's really fantastic. We had 130, 34 women highlighted in this um, exhibit. And we also um, were really, I think, I, great kudos to the curation and exhibits team. 34 of those women are still living because oftentimes people think of trailblazers of the past. They think of women who lived a hundred years ago and are no longer with us, but there are so many women here now doing amazing work that are making history as we speak. And it's really inspirational to, I think, younger people. So if um, I can have your, uh, Attention for another moment, I want to show you this um, really quickly. Um, I will warn you, this virtual tour, if you're watching it, not driving it, um, it can zoom a little quickly. And if you get a little seasick, just close your, your eyes for a moment um, to bear with us. But this uh, took up two galleries in the museum. It was, again, very spectacular. So as you, this is how you enter and talks about trailblazing. Um, but you can zoom through the site, it does all these tours um, turns. So you can see we had um, women who were made of steel, revolutionaries, voices of change um, who were through here. I wanna highlight a couple of the um, barrier breakers and um, in this gallery, because I, or a lot of the contemporary women are in the barrier breaker um, section right now. I just got to notice that my battery was running low. I've got to have it, of course. Um, but I want to point out one in particular. Um, so I'm going to zoom here, and then I will let you all explore at your own. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Gabby Lemieux. Um, Gabby, at the time this exhibit was up, was 23, so she's 24 now. She's a member of the Nez, of the uh, excuse me, Shoshone Paiute tribe, and she is an LPGA golfer, professional golfer, and an ambassador for Nike um, for Native American women and girls to become involved in athletics and find a voice and um, be more involved in their communities. So one example of a young trailblazer highlighted, oh my gosh, Did her no, I'm worried her battery died. <laughs> All right, she'll she'll join us, I'm sure. In the meantime, if people want to add questions in the chat, we'll have plenty of time for Q and A and discussion with Deanna. So if you've been thinking of things as she's been going through the slides, feel free to add that, and we'll help moderate that conversation when she hopefully joins. <laughs> I don't know if Lauren and I can answer the questions. <laughs> I'm, I am not knowledgeable enough to answer any questions. But maybe what I can do in the meantime is talk about our next speaker. Sure. Fill the time. Yeah. Um, so we would have done this at the end, um, but our speaker on Friday, so this is unusual. Oh, here she is. Okay. Oh, no. That's, That's just me. Sharing the... Um, the poster. So our speaker on Friday, and this is unusual for us to have a speaker on Friday, this is going to be in person at the 1912 Center. And our speaker is Joe Ivester. And um, she's uh, written a book called Once a Girl, Always a Boy. 
and she's going to be talking about the politics of raising a transgender child. Um, and her talk is a look at what it's like to have a transgender son in a world not quite ready for people like him. Jo describes her son's experiences going back to early childhood when he first showed signs of being transgender. Um, and by making people feel comfortable with those who are different from them, Jo equips her audiences with tools to consciously navigate and help them to navigate a world with acceptance in regard to race, religion, sexual orientation, and gender identification. So I think that's going to be a really, really interesting talk because it's not just an academic talk. She's going to be telling stories from her personal experience, and she's um, definitely an activist um, and um, has certainly had to deal with the politics of raising a transgender child. So I hope you'll all be there and, um, and join us. And there's Diana. Okay. I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> I am so sorry. That's okay. a first. <laughs> so I was just showing off that exhibit um, and I won't zoom everybody through it um, quite literally, but it, if you go to history.idaho.gov slash exhibits um, and scroll to trailblazing at the bottom of the page, you can take your time to go through it. It's, it's beautiful. Um, honored some really fantastic women. And I think, you know, Lauren, I came in just as you were introducing your next speaker to talk about transgender issues. I do want to point out um, one of the women highlighted was Joe jo Monahan. And I don't know if you're all familiar with Joe, little Joe. Um, Joe was a well known and beloved ranch hand for years in Idaho. In, the late 1800s, and uh, nobody realized Joe was female until Joe passed away, and they were preparing they were preparing them for burial. So Joe had lived this life um, that you know at the time nobody knew, but I think is a really inspirational story and powerful story to tell. So. Um, you can see that in that 360 tour. Um, so again, that's at history.idaho.gov slash exhibits. Uh, and that's again, part of the inspiration for the form that the sculpture is taking to, to represent all of those women together. So, and again, my apologies for my abrupt departure. <laughs> it's always something. <laughs> oh my gosh, I miss in person so much. <laughs> Okay, um, so Joan says that when she sends out the link to the video, she'll include a separate paragraph showing how our members and others can contribute. So that'll oh, be a you. way for us to, to have that direct. Um, right now, ah, okay, so Karen is asking, do you have any book recommendations to learn more about Idaho history? Oh my gosh, there's so much Idaho history. There are so many books. Um, and Earl might have some great options here, but we do have like for a super high level that kind of teases a lot of other things. Um, when the museum was um, reopened in 2018, a companion book for the exhibits there was written called Idaho, Its Land and Its People. And that's available. Um, all of the libraries have it. We made sure all of the libraries have, including the university libraries. Uh, several of the county archives also have it, but you can purchase that um, through, again, idaho.history.gov. If you go to the online store, it's available there. Really high level, um, but it teases a lot of um, a lot of the great things. And it, you know, it depends on what part of Idaho history you're interested in. What I do recommend, and people don't realize is such a wonderful resource, is if you go to the Idaho State Archives page on that website, it keeps saying idaho.history.gov and go to state archives. There's so many online resources there that are available as well as photographs. And that's a really great place to start because um, it's it's almost like unwe uh, unraveling a sweater, you know, you pull a thread and there's more and there's more and there's more and there's more. So I don't have one book <laughs> um, to really recommend, but that is such an excellent question, Karen. Thank you. Um. 
I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, this, um, okay, Lake Talk County Historical Society has many for purchase in our office too. That's from Haley. Oh, thank you, Haley. Hi, Haley. Haley used to be uh, be with us and she made that wonderful move over to Lake Talk. Good mm -hmm. to see you. Um, any other questions for Deanna? I just ah, put a question in there. <laughs> what were some of the debates in the development process of the sculpture? Also, what should we call the sculpture? Ooh, good question. So the, the sculpture's official name is the Idaho Women's Suffrage Commemorative Sculpture, which is really long. Um, and we didn't specifically give her a name because we didn't want that to then represent something specific to people. We wanted it to be more universal and more embracing of so many um, different backgrounds and cultures. So but some of the debates were um, really what form and shape should she take? Um, some of the initial drawings, um, you saw some of those, but some even the ones prior to that was very much more in the shape of the woman on our state seal, but that doesn't necessarily represent all Idaho women. I mean, our, our um, Latina friends would not see themselves represented in that. Our, our African-American Idahoans would not see themselves represented in that. So she took a little bit more um, rounded, I mean that both physically as well as metaphorically um, shaped to that. Did want to honor with the hair and did really want to honor um, the woman in the state seal who's, you know, we don't know if there was a model for that or if that was a creation of Emma Edwards Green or if that was in some way a self-portrait of Emma Edwards Green herself. Um, we also had a lot of conversations about the shoes. It was important to the historical society and several of the committee members that the shoes that represent those footsteps and those footprints that were taken, that those were represented a lot of different women and types. So we did, um, as I mentioned, have those slippers from a family that was incarcerated at Minidoka. Um, so it's, you know, it's not all the super happy history either. And we did have Holly Bemis's shoes in there to represent the Chinese and, and you know, Polly's shoes are the only ones that we really kind of do attribute to one person because that's the only sample of those types of shoes we have in our collection. Um, I will tell you, I'm a veteran and I lobbied for the combat boots to be included. I thought that was very important and that was very symbolic change in the late 80s, early 90s. So we were really trying to pull, and by we, I mean, actually the curators, <laughs> were trying to pull um, shoes that were incredibly symbolic of that era to be part of that. So that was a lot of that. And then when we realized in our collection, we did not have any Native American moccasins. So we worked with Randy L. Teton at the Shoshone Bannock tribe to find what would be appropriate. And the rose pattern that is on the shoes is very common across all of Idaho's tribes. So that was very important to us as well. Um, so I think, the size of it, um, I think she grew over time. Um, she started out life size, which would have been about, you know, five, 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 seven, and then decided that um, given the size of the Bora statue, given the size of some of the other statues on the grounds, that she should be of equal height and not be, um, if they're of heroic size, then this, this sculpture that represents all women should also be of heroic size to do that. So those were some of the debates. Um, that happened through that. And also, you know, how do we fundraise for that? How do we um, take care of that cost? And we, we knew we didn't want taxpayer money of that. And then it became very obvious very early that, that we wanted this to be statewide. I mean, it, it is obviously in Boise, but it's the people's house. That, that lawn belongs to the people of Idaho. That building belongs to the, the people of Idaho. So that was another conversation we had for that. So I hope that answers your questions. Okay, thank um, you. I am not- If, I could, if I could just add in, the, yeah. um, the when you go around to the state capitol, 
one of the things that has always surprised me is how few statues there are on the Capitol grounds. Uh, when you go into the into the uh, entrance to the Capitol, of course, a ways away from that, looking at the Capitol is Frank Stunenberg, uh, who was, of course, our only governor that was assassinated in the state of Idaho. And there's very, very few others. And the person that asked about references to Idaho history, this is going to be, in my opinion, a huge stimulus because when you go up to it, you wonder, what is it about? And when you look at the shoes, there it is. There is Idaho's <laughs> history all outlined in a nice long row. And I, I think it's going to be huge. I do not know how many other state capitals have paid homage to the, their women's history. But Idaho, like we were one of the first with suffrage, I think we're going to be one of the first with a seven foot statue to recognize how important all the women uh, in Idaho have been. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Okay, any other questions from our group? I am not seeing any. So, Tiana, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm looking for. We're going to be going through Boise, but I guess she's not up yet. So <laughs> she's not up yet. Christmas, right? Uh, we hope to have her in by then. And I, um, I will tell you. So again, a reason to follow um, our website and our social media is this. This is going to be fun. So Irene has said that when she brings her sculptures back from the foundry in Enterprise, Oregon, which is you know along I-84, she brings them back upright on a flatbed trailer. So we're going to have this seven foot woman flying down the interstate <laughs> on the back of a flatbed. And that is going to be kind of fun. So we will have um, obviously some media around that in social media. So I hope um, I hope you will watch that because that's going to be pretty interesting. <laughs> be fun if she did a, a whistle stop to her. So, that, you know, she stopped along the way and showed it off. Yeah. And talked about it. yeah. Thank you again. Kylie, do you? have anything to say? I don't. Thank you so much, Deanna, for spending time with us today. And I, I certainly learned a lot and really look forward to seeing this the next time that I'm in Boise. And so we'll follow along with the journey. Uh, that please, do, please do. <laughs> yeah. And thank, thank you again, um, you know, for having us for, and I hope you do visit our website. We have a lot of online resources um, for those of you who don't get to Boise very frequently. And, um, and I, I hope you can spend some time with that 360 tour of trailblazing because, um, you know, I think Haley was very involved in that too. It was, it's beautiful. And we were, we didn't intend for that to be a legacy project um, of the Women 100, but we were very fortunate to come across somebody in Boise who did these 360 tours and is hosting that for free for us. And it's spectacular. So enjoy that. But thank you very much. Yeah, we'll include the links and I see Haley talking about the exhibit as well in the chat so make sure to yeah. check that as well um, but yeah we'll send out all of these links uh, if you want to send the articles you mentioned too we Great. can pass those along I'm sure people would like to read more in depth on some of the subjects that you covered today as well I'll go ahead and stop the recording here and we'll get this uploaded